you want me to be Perfect one So easy to see Why I push you away Heaven inside my heart And hell in front of me Oh, I walk the endless miles To where I need to be And it's all the same We're holding out for change Hi everybody, this is Richard Sachs I'm your host on Lost Arts Radio Thanks for being with us today We've got a really relevant and real-life situation to talk about with a great guest who's been kind enough to be with us. And what this is about, we were talking with our friend Heather Scott, who's been on the program many times. And uh, there was this incident which reflects uh, a policy that needs attention called uh, civil asset forfeiture and also others related to uh, drug laws and things like that. And what happened is, and we'll get into more detail of this with our guest, there were tr- one or more trucks going across the state of Idaho, and they were carrying industrial hemp, which is a really important, valuable uh, crop that's useful for too many things to list right now. And the uh, truck drivers got stopped. I'm not sure why they got stopped, but I guess it's maybe had to do with declaring what they had at a, a way station or something like that. We'll find out the detail. And the uh, police there decided it would be a good idea to arrest them as criminals, potential criminals, for hauling a massive uh, amount of drugs across the state, which, of course, is not true at all. It's not a drug. Whether legal or illegal, it's not a drug. And... Um, the, they got a judge and a prosecutor who decided that's a great idea. We should, you know, charge them with as much as we can, send them to prison and all this. And this is right after the federal government had clarified that it was completely legal all over the country. But the process of making that acknowledged in the proper records is not complete. So there's this issue right now that these drivers are and their their crop are being held, not their crop, but their cargo. And uh, it needs public attention immediately. So Heather was able to introduce me to Ilana Rubel, who's another representative within the uh, legislature in Idaho. And I was hoping she'd be willing to come on and talk to us about what's happening and what can be done by the public and how to get more attention to it and spread awareness. So that happened, and uh, I just really appreciate it. So welcome, Ilana, and I'm looking forward to it should be a really interesting discussion. Thank you so much for shining a light on this horrible, horrible situation. Um, It's hard to believe these things can happen in America sometimes. Yeah, yeah, a lot of things. (laughs) Yeah, a lot of things, but this one is really unbelievable. So how Uh, did I mess up the description? Oh, no, you were pretty darn close. So we actually have three different truckers right now in Idaho um, in different incidents. Um, There were two truckers that were um, pulled over in one stop with industrial hemp. Um, Their situation, it's it's very, very frustrating. Um, They were pulled over last year in 2018. Um, and these guys, I mean, I got it. I got an email from the father and I, you know what? I should read it to you. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, let's do that. Yeah. You know what? Let me do that. I mean, it's so heartbreaking. This kid, you know, he, he, you know, college graduate excited. He wanted to get involved in outdoor education. He was excited to get involved in the, in the hemp industry. Um, he's 26 years old and, um, thought what he was doing was perfectly legal because hemp has been legalized nationally and it is legal in over 40 states. I think a few months ago it was legal in 41 states. I think it's legal in significantly more now because I think a lot of states were taking it up in this most recent legislative session. So we're rapidly getting to a point where it's basically going to be legal absolutely everywhere in America except for Idaho. And he was driving it from a state where it was legal to another state where it was legal and was pulled over, never suspecting what they were doing was, was illegal. Why was and he it was pulled, just, By the way, why was he pulled over? What was visible that made him do that? 
I think they just pull these loads over again. I'm not a commercial truck driver, but I think when you have large loads, you just have to pull over and report what you have okay. um, and make sure that, you know, you're within the weight limits and all that. Um, and uh, and when the cops discovered it was industrial, well, hemp, they treated it as marijuana in Idaho. They draw no distinction whatsoever between marijuana and hemp. Um, so these guys were charged with a trafficking, you know, large amounts of marijuana. Now, the situation got worse then because under Idaho's law, Idaho has a lot of ridiculous laws. I mean, the first level of legal failure, I think, is treating hemp like marijuana. The second problem is that we have these mandatory minimum sentencing laws, which force the judges, basically, they have no ability under our system to exercise any judgment whatsoever. Basically, the only thing they can look at is the amount of, quote, drugs in the person's possession. And based on that amount, it triggers a mandatory sentence with no possibility of parole, no flexibility whatsoever in sentencing. So the prosecutors came in and charged these first two guys with um, basically a, a trafficking charge that carried five years mandatory in prison. Well, what happens then is, you know, when a person ha- is, it, it's a hammer, right? I mean, the prosecutors have this hammer over people's heads where they say, if you go to trial, you are going to have five years mandatory in prison, no parole. So you basically have to take whatever deal we'll give you and plead guilty. So they effectively force these first two guys to plead guilty um, to uh, a, a, a slightly reduced charge, but basically one that is still drug dealing, um, possession of possession of drugs with intent to deliver. So they've been forced to plead to that, um, and they're awaiting sentencing. So that's the first two guys, which is, um, it, uh, they, they were captured last year. Um, now, they could still get sprung, because the only, but the only person that can do it is the prosecutor. But if the prosecutor decided to drop the charges, even though they've pled, until sentencing happens, they could still walk away from this with no criminal record, no jail time, no nothing. Um, so it's all in the prosecutor's hands. Then the third guy gets real interesting because the third guy, um, he was, uh, that was after the federal farm bill had passed nationally in 2018, legalizing marijuana from coast to coast at the federal level. This guy, um, you know, hardworking guy, low income, English is his second language. I think he might be Polish or something. Working for a trucking company, just took the load that his boss gave him as any trucker would um, and was driving it along, presented himself voluntarily at the port of entry to Idaho. So he goes up to the, to the Idaho State Police and says, oh, here I am at the port of entry. Here's my bill of lading. Clearly thought everything he was doing was perfectly legal. And they say, hey, buddy, you're going to jail. And they were bragging about it as the big, they were called the, quote, the biggest marijuana bust in Idaho history. These are the people uh, at the way station, basically, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So the, yeah, this so the, is the exciting from, point of their day. They could be like Batman or something, catching the big bad guys. Catching the big bad guy who voluntarily presented himself with his exactly. bill of lading. It was because of their incredible skill as heroes that he did that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so very frustrating. Um, and and as I said, you know, I mean, this gentleman's, you know, English is his second language, so he's had to have a translator at all these proceedings. Um, well, this one, you know, the lawyers are for now. They haven't rolled over yet. He's also being faced with the five-year mandatory minimum prison sentence, um, but he hasn't pled yet. They're trying to take it to the Ninth Circuit, and they're making a claim that constitutionally under the Interstate Commerce Clause, because this had been legalized federally, um, Idaho did not have a right to arrest him for transporting it through Idaho. That case, they've, they've already lost that at the at the lower court level. Because, you know, very real technicality. The lower court said because even though the law had passed, because they hadn't finished finalizing the rules that go along with the the law, that, you know, he was caught in this window of time, that had he been caught after the rules had been finalized, then, yes, he would have been protected under the Constitution's interstate commerce laws. But because he was in this little window of time between when the federal law passed but before the rules were finalized, that Idaho was still allowed to arrest people. It's ridiculous. As, is there a glitch. trial involved in this or just a judge making a proclamation? Well, on this particular point, because this is just a fine legal point of, you know, did the interstate commerce clause kick in as soon as the federal law passed or does it only kick in after the rules are finalized? So that legal point, which is important to him because that determines whether they can bring charges against him, that's right. going up to the Ninth Circuit right now. But then once they decide that, then he's got a tough 
then he's in a tough spot because if he loses at the Ninth Circuit and they say yes, you know, because of this weird legal technicality, Idaho wow. could still arrest him, then he's either got to go to trial or he's got to roll over and plead. And he's right. probably going to have to roll over and plead because of that mandatory minimum sentence threat. You just can't take the chance on going to trial because he would lose. I mean, honestly, applying the law, he would lose. The law is crazy right. enough that it's there's no question he did have 6,700 pounds of hemp. And under the law, there, there's no wiggle room. That would force, you know, and the judge, I, mean, I can't uh, blame the judge. Uh, uh, the no, judge the has judge no has no discretion in it. But yep. if, you, if you had a really conscious jury, they could nullify the whole thing, right? Well, that's true. So you'd have to be pretty brave, though, to go to trial in the yeah, hopes because, of a jury that's willing to nullify. Most juries aren't really brilliant, I mean, from what they're doing. And, well, uh, right. So you'd be really rolling the dice. And so probably he would have to do what the first two truckers did, which is roll over and plead to being a drug dealer, go out into the world with a felony conviction, be unable to get work. Um, so the only thing that can the only thing that can save these guys right now, truly save them, not have a criminal record, not go to prison, is the prosecutor dropping charges. Right. That's it. So if we get billions of people to tell the prosecutor, hey, you know, laws are supposed to be subservient to, and helpful to humans, not vice versa. <laughs> and exactly. Exactly. So in that spirit, because, you know, all the power has, you know, come down to this one prosecutor, we started a petition online. Um, basically, you know, again, nothing, we can't force the prosecutor to do anything, but we can at least express the public sentiment that we sure hope they do the right thing here. Because the prosecutor's elected, right? I mean, they do ultimately answer to the people at the ballot box. Um, so hopefully they will be somewhat interested in what the people have to say. So if your listeners want to sign the petition, um, yeah. you can find Find it at change.org, and if you just type hemp in the search bar there, it'll pop right up. Um, and okay. so far, we have over 12,500 signatures. And Do you have to live in better. Idaho to sign it? I, I mean, I think people anywhere signing it's a good thing. I would think um, so, yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't eliminate you if you're not an Idaho citizen, right? No, sign. no, no. It doesn't eliminate you. Now, you know, the, the prosecutor okay. may be more interested in what her own voters say than people from outside. But I think it's still powerful to show that this is so outrageous, it's drawing attention from around the nation. When you put your signature in there, do they ask you for your physical address or not? They do. They, they do. do. So it would okay. show with your zip code. So it would show that you're not from Idaho. And uh, how, lo which, how long is that petition? Um, the petition is, you know, I'm sure I could find it online and read it to you if you yeah, want. So you I'm probably have it there if, if you have a browser. It's, it's a no, pretty short on. petition. It's a paragraph long, just, okay. you know, laying out, you know, saying, uh, dear Ms. Prosecutor, we would like you to exercise your discretion here to drop the charges against these three gentlemen um, that, you know, it's... I can't even describe how ridiculous the situation is. I mean, I again, if he'd been, this last guy, if he'd been pulled over four months from now when the rules had been finished, right. then he, he wouldn't be going to jail. Um, Idaho would be legally prohibited from prosecuting him for this. So he just got very unlucky, very understandable. You know, I mean, I think that most of us would have done exactly what he did. Most oh, of sure. us, if our, we're working for a company, our company says, hey, drive this from point A to point B. We've seen in the paper, this was just legalized federally. This guy's not a lawyer. I mean, who would actually think to get online and conduct legal research to discover that Idaho is one of the few places in the nation that still bans industrial hemp? Nobody would think to do that. Is anybody okay. charging the company for doing this or not? Um, well, the company, you know, can't really be criminally charged under the trafficking laws because the trafficking laws just look at who's physically there and in possession. And this uh. driver was the one who was, you know, physically. But the company has a dog in this fight, too, because, again, just this is such a snowball of disaster. It's amazing. Like everything that can go wrong in the law here did. Um, but civil asset forfeiture. So they took this truck and all the cargo and they're seizing it and they want to take it and sell it and keep the proceeds. Um, because under our civil asset forfeiture laws, you know, you can take a vehicle or whatever other property was used in the course of committing a drug trafficking offense. Right. <laughs> right. Amazing. So yeah. do you, would you, is it convenient for you to read that paragraph and let people oh, know exactly bet. what it sounds like? Um, yeah, if you don't mind, hold on. I hope no, take your I'm going to have to change oh. browsers here, but um, I think you can still see me even when I'm doing that, right? Yeah, we can still see you. It's fine. Okay. Here, I'm just going to pull up. The, I'll, I'll read it to you. It's very short, as I said. Um, I'm going to get to the... 
Hmm, well, this is interesting. Okay, search. Okay, I'll have this in a sec. Yeah, so we put this together just kind of because we were out of options, and it's all in this one person's hands, and all we can really do is get as many people to ask as possible. So right. that's what we did. Um and, you know, in the future, maybe we can do a better job with passing better laws. But we have basically a few weeks to save these guys because once sentencing happens, there's really not much that can be done. Even a, even, a part, even a pardon from the governor at that point won't clean your criminal record. It might save you from doing prison time, but it won't, okay. it won't clean up your record. Right. So here's the, what the petition says. <clears throat> We are writing to ask that the Ada County Prosecutor's Office drop all charges against Andrew Daddario, Eric Eisenhart, and Dennis Palomarchuk, three truck drivers who were arrested and charged for driving industrial hemp across Idaho. Hemp has been legalized at the federal level and is legal in nearly every other state. We do not want our tax dollars spent prosecuting or incarcerating these individuals, and we do not feel their future employment prospects should be clouded with a criminal record on account of their work transporting hemp. It is cruel to upend these men's lives in the current manner, and frankly, it is an embarrassment to the state of Idaho. You are the only player in our legal system who has the power to fix the situation and ensure they can go on with their lives without a criminal record from these events. Please wisely use the discretion that you have been given and drop the charges immediately. So That's well worded. I like it. Well, thank you. I wrote it. <laughs> yeah, you did a great job. So thank you. That should Appreciate be everywhere. And uh, what about additionally... Uh, calling or emailing the office of this prosecutor. Could that be done too? Absolutely, that can be done. Hold let's on, get, and if you want, I can get you that email address. Yes, yeah, so let's get some um, contact information out there. You betcha. Okay, hang on. I'm going to get that for you in a sec. Okay. Uh, so if you, everyone has their pens handy, um, yeah. the email address, the uh, Ada County prosecutor is Jan Bennett's. J A N? Uh, J A N uh, Bennett's, B E N N E T T S. And the email Bennett's. address okay. there is J Bennett's J B uh, J B E N N E T T S at okay. um, it's at Ada County that's A D A County dot okay. dot I D dot gov I D dot G O V okay yeah. All right. um, and, yeah, uh, right. yeah, so we, as I said, we will be physically delivering a printout of whatever the signatures we have as of when we walk in today at 3.15 p.m. We're yeah. going down to the Ada County Courthouse today to deliver the petition, but we're still collecting signatures. I mean, the online petition is still open, and every time a media outlet covers this issue, they log on to change.org and they report how many signatures there are at that point. Okay, so good. getting more signatures is helpful even after we've done the physical delivery to the press. She will about, know how many signatures there are on there. What about people nicely uh, calling them up to talk about it for a while on the phone? Oh, well, you could always try that, too. Um, I don't have her number handy, but I think if you Google, I could do that now. If you Google Ada County Prosecutor, um, right. I think there's a phone number on that website. Okay, so do you want to give that to us? Yeah, hang on. I'm going to Google that next. Yeah, hold on. Yeah, uh, um, I mean, it's really, it's horrible to think that, you know, and I feel a real, real personal responsibility to do everything in my power here because this is our, we are all doing this. You know, at least every Idaho taxpayer is doing this to these gentlemen in a sense. You know, it's our money yeah, being yeah. used to finance this apparatus and um, it's being done in our name. And so I think we have a pretty affirmative duty to scream and yell very loudly to make sure that, you know, we're not complicit in this. Yeah, you know, it'd be nice if, if there were a provision in law, if you find a, a law that was clearly should never have existed, and it gets changed and eliminated, to change it retroactively and eliminate the criminal record of the people who broke it. Right. No kidding. Because, you know, when these rules finally get finalized in three months and, you know, it's no longer illegal to drive hemp across Idaho, how ridiculous to have put these guys through this. And they, their lives will still be ruined if they still. The, so mm -hmm. I found the phone. Wait, uh, the you, phone your, picture for froze, your, your picture froze for a minute. So start oh, it over. did? Yeah. Uh oh. And oh. It's okay. It's back. It's back. <laughs> We, Am I back? Okay, you're great. Back. So I what's found the, the phone number. The yeah. phone number for the Ada County Prosecutor's Office is 208 uh -huh. 287 okay. 7700. Okay, and I want to make a comment on people who choose to call that it's not to fight with this lady. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. to, as long as she's relatively civil, it's to tell her she's got an opportunity 
to show wisdom in administration of the, of the law and prosecution by realizing that this is a law that should have been nullified a long time ago. And hemp was still not a drug way before they recognized that at the federal level. So right. to have that kind of common sense, that's why jury nullification was instituted in America. Is because if there's a ridiculous law, it shouldn't apply to anybody. So right. You know. I mean, this is a genuinely ridiculous law, and you know our legislature deserves some blame here too because you know we make the laws, and this right. is absolutely something that should have been fixed a long time ago. There were many of us who have wanted to fix this for a long time, but it's our efforts have been blocked. We had a bill to legalize hemp this session that we thought was going to pass, and it ultimately kind of got blocked by the state police. Um, now, wh- why would why would they do that? Do you think? Well, I mean, they were concerned that if hemp le- is legal, that it will be too hard for them to tell the difference between hemp and marijuana, and so they'll have a difficult time enforcing marijuana the marijuana ban if people are allowed to you know grow and sell and transport hemp yeah. without a lot of restrictions. So yeah. they wanted what they you know they what they wanted was a really aggressive regulatory regimen that would have set up checkpoints all around the state and um, to the point where a lot of the people who even were advocates of legalizing hemp thought that they they couldn't support that kind of checkpoint apparatus um, and so you know between the people that were angry at this checkpoint apparatus and the, you know, all that it, it collapsed the bill ended yeah. up collapsing. Well, I mean, there's there's an obvious solution to that, and, and I would preface it by saying I'm not an advocate of, of drugs, natural or unnatural, because <clears throat> I've watched the effects on people's brains over decades, and as a health counselor and scientist, I, I'd say that's not smart to use those things. However, um, or to smoke anything is really not good for you, yeah. but to make it criminal is a whole other issue, and I think having... Uh, Marijuana illegal is another ridiculous thing because I don't think it should be up to the government at all about that. Most of the jails are full of people on marijuana charges, and yeah. um, it's ruining a lot more lives. So oh, why I mean, not just is- solve, solve it by decriminalizing marijuana and you don't have to worry about telling the difference? It's remarkable how many nonviolent people were incarcerating on these charges. And mm-hmm. I agree. I mean, I would like to see as little drug use in the world as possible. Right. Um, but, you know, the amount of money we're spending locking people up, it just seems would be so much better spent on education programs and rehabilitation yeah. programs and just a lot of other ways that would probably be much more effective in getting people to not use drugs. If we had real education, I don't think there'd be an issue. Because yeah. the things that you can do developing yourself just put drugs to shame. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, the permanent high that you get by becoming who you really are and and there's no downside. You don't come down from it. You don't ruin your lungs. You don't do any of that stuff. Nobody'd be able to sell drugs because yeah, you know they don't they don't have the uses that people think they do. No, I think that's right. And if people saw the cautionary tales, if you know, and if there were you know real education on what it really does to people's lives, um, it just. Uh, I think there's a lot more potential to do that, but it's incredible. You know, I've been working on mandatory minimum reform for a long time here in Idaho, and uh, the statistics are really remarkable. I mean, it's, you know, 83%, I think, of the people that we're locking up have no violent history whatsoever. Um, 42, at least on the mandatory minimum charges, 42% are first-time offenders, Um, and you know, I could, I could, I could talk to your listeners for several hours just on the mandatory minimum front. I mean, it's unbelievable. Well, it's a really important subject. I, I don't think oh. almost any, almost no one knows about it. I know, you know? I know. So it's, it's it's not so bad for you to explain it more if you want. I to. would love. You know what? You, I, I will talk to anybody that will listen on mandatory minimum sentences because I've learned so much about it, and it's one of the most scandalous things out there. I, I learned about it actually. I start. I was started out by working on civil asset forfeiture, and I was working on a bill to reform that in Idaho, uh, because Idaho's laws on that were really unbelievable. I mean, they could pretty much just take anything in Idaho that was lying anywhere near drugs. It didn't have to be related to a drug offense. They could just take your purse, your car, your wedding jewelry, like anything. They didn't have to report it. They didn't have to bring charges. It was. I mean, let's, was let's use realistic language here. What you mean is they could steal all these things. <laughs> well, I mean, I hope that it wasn't. I mean, legally used. steal, of course. 
Well, I mean, you know, we'll never know the extent to which it was being abused because there was no reporting. There was no requirement that they keep records of what they were taking or what they were doing with it. So it was very hard to track down, you know, whether every, you know, maybe all the cops were being saints. Maybe they weren't. We'll never know because there was no transparency. But at any rate, I was working on reforming that for years. And as I was talking to, I talked to judges, I talked to criminal defense attorneys, I talked to these folks and said, hey, you know, I'm working on reforming criminal asset forfeiture, what do you think? Am I barking up the right tree here? Um, And they all said, like, absolutely, you should definitely fix that. Our system is crazy. But let me tell you what the biggest injustice in our system is. It's mandatory minimum sentencing. I'm not a criminal attorney, so I, but I heard it from enough people that I thought I'd really look into this because, you know, if all these people are independently raising it as a big problem, then civil asset forfeiture, I should figure out what this is all about. And, uh, why were they? This is really unbelievable. I mean, at least in Idaho, and I think some other states, although other states are starting to fix up their laws, basically what the law says is the only thing they can look at is the volume of drugs. Wait, wait, I'll and hold they, on. Hold on. You're, you don't you're, have to be uh, El- Ilana, Ilana, you are completely breaking up there. Uh oh. Uh, I suspect you're on a Wi Fi connection, right? I am. Yeah, those are not as steady. So, what we want to go back to is when you were clear, you said the only thing you can look at and start from there. Yeah. So under our mandatory minimum sentencing laws, um, the only thing that a judge can look at in determining sentencing is the volume of drugs in your possession. And it's a possession offense. You don't have to be a dealer. (laughs) Um, A lot of these guys, it's really they were possessing drugs for personal use. And for example, you know, if you have more than two grams of heroin, which for a lot of people is, you know, one or two days use personal use. So if you have two grams of heroin in your possession, I think it's that indexes to three years in prison, no possibility of parole. Doesn't matter if you're a first-time offender, doesn't matter if you're nonviolent, doesn't matter if you're a straight-A student and this is the first time in your life you've ever screwed up. Nothing matters. Prison, no, no flexibility. Um, and, you know, so that's it. It's just they index it to, you know, two grams means this many years, five grams means this many years, 10 grams means, you know, 15 years. I mean, it's, it's pretty wild. Um, and the judges hate it. So I don't blame the judges a bit. I have I have a big, thick stack of transcripts of judges in sentencing hearings saying, you know, it's I am horrified that I have to give you this sentence. If I could do anything else, I would. But the legislature has tied my hands. So let me ask you a question. If the judges think it's really stupid, which it obviously is not just stupid, it's malicious. (laughs) And, and, you know, there's two things that I would want to ask you. First, where did it come from if everybody agrees that it's really stupid? (laughs) And the other thing is, if you look at motivation... Not everything is motivated but by money, but a lot is. And so I know in many states, and maybe most of them, prisons have been privatized into a mm. for-profit business. They're incorporated. They belong to private companies. They work as a subcontractor for the state government, and they make tons of money. And if you have mandatory minimums, it changes their bottom line radically. So those are the two things I'd want to ask about. Oh, those are super good points. Yeah. So let me um, hold on. Let me unpack those. Well, the judges, you know, judges aren't allowed to really lobby here. Um, it's considered, you know, they have to maintain their judicial demeanor and not. So there was actually one judge who did come in to testify in support of my bill to get rid of mandatory minimums, and she got yelled at by the Supreme Court and disciplined for coming in and testifying at a hearing. So the judges are really muzzled. Um, so in order to get their perspective, I actually had to go digging into transcripts from hearings where they were actually saying to the defendants on the record, because they're not allowed to come into the legislature and testify for bills. Um, but I got, a, I got a good thick stack of transcripts, as I said, of judges saying, you know, I wish to God I had the power to give you a different sentence. And ironically, in Idaho, they do have that power for any other crime. Um, if, you know, if you, you know, rape, arson, kidnapping, burglary, child molestation, I mean, almost any crime that you can think of, the judge does have the power to come up with a sentence that they think fits the crime and look at the totality of the circumstances and, you know, and say, well, this person is a hardened criminal versus this person is a first time offender. They can take all that into account. The only exceptions really are 
first degree murder, um, drug trafficking, which as I said, really means drug possession, um, okay. and repeated sexual abuse of a child. Not the first time, but repeated sexual abuse of a child, that comes with a mandatory. Everything else, they have discretion. So you asked the good question of why do we have these? Um, they came about really, they're kind of an artifact from the war on drugs from the late 80s, early 90s, um, that are just still on the books. Um, we, I've been trying for three years to get rid of them, and every time I have... I've gotten it through the House of Representatives with a supermajority, but then we keep running into a block on the Senate. The prosecutors hate my bill. They love mandatory minimum sentencing because, you know, we saw how it played out with these hemp truck drivers. It makes them all powerful. They are the, the prosecutors can do whatever they want, right? They don't have to bring the maximum charge. They can wheel and deal. They can lower charges. They can drop charges. But as long as they've got this mandatory minimum sentence out there, they've got a hammer over people's head that they can make anybody plead. They can make an innocent person plead. I mean, I had a woman in my district come to me and say, and, you know, I wasn't in the car with her. I personally don't know what, but what she told me was she was in a car with her husband and her husband had a broken leg. And so she was driving him around and he had a bunch of weed in the trunk and she didn't know it was there. Um, but they got pulled over. And because she was driving the car, she was technically considered in possession of the marijuana. Now, she says she didn't know it was there. The cops had no proof that they had no evidence that she had any knowledge of this. Now, in an ideal world, she would have liked to go to trial and made her case and say, I'm completely innocent. I shouldn't go to jail at all. I didn't know it was there. Without knowledge, you can't get me. Um, but she couldn't do that because You know, if God forbid they don't believe you, which can always happen anytime you go to trial, you roll the dice, they may believe you, they may not. And if she was not successful in convincing them that she didn't have knowledge, five years, no possibility of parole. She has young children. She couldn't take that chance. And so she had to plead guilty to a lesser charge because the threat of that mandatory was so serious that she couldn't take the chance. So, I mean, anytime you have mandatory minimum sentences, you're running a risk that you're actually going to be locking up innocent people because of this, you know, incredible bludgeon that the prosecutors have. But, of course, prosecutors like that, right? I mean, they like having that power. They win every time. I mean, as long as mandatory minimums are on the books. They win every case. They can get people to plead to at least something every single time. They don't have to go to trial. Isn't it Um, weird that people have gotten so (laughs) out of touch with basic ethical behavior that they think that's good? I mean, that's like what kind of... I mean, I think that, you know, I do think that the prosecutors, you know, believe that they are doing the right thing. You know, I don't think that they're acting maliciously here. You know, I do think as with anything in life, there's a risk that you, you know, fall into the mind game of just wanting to win. Right. That's what I'm and talking about. Yeah. Yeah. That you you sort of see it as like you know my goal here is to try to get the most people locked up for as long as possible, right. and mandatory minimums certainly give you that tool to do that. Well, what happened this year was the chairman of the Senate committee is a former prosecutor himself. He said he was not going to allow a hearing or a vote on any bill that the prosecutors oppose. And so even though I got my bill passed through the House with a supermajority, he wouldn't even allow it a vote. So it died in the Senate because right. of that. Right, right. But any time people have heard my case, um, it's passed with a supermajority. Any time I've really had a chance to lay the case out there with all the data and they've actually been allowed to vote, it's gone through like a freight train. It's, it's just the problem is it's been blocked through these kind of backroom arrangements. In, in a committee, in a particular committee that you're talking about? Yeah, in a committee. And it was the Senate Judiciary and Rules Committee where they blocked it from ever getting a hearing. Okay, so most people don't know what the general idea of the procedure is for a bill. So Mm -hmm. if somebody thinks of a bill who's a representative, and I guess you have a House and a Senate in Idaho, right? Yep. Okay. And the bills come from the House all the time? or No, they can come from either place. Um, I'm in the House, so I usually start them out in the House just because that's, you know, kind of more handier for me. It's where I usually operate. Whichever place they start in, what are the steps they go through to become a law? Great question. Yeah. So, um, First, you, you have to pass it in the committee where you start out. So in my case, you know, I got it passed through the House Judiciary and Rules Committee overwhelmingly. Um, we had a very long hearing, lots of heart-wrenching testimony from, I'll get into that in a second. I mean, some of these stories, the prosecutors want you to think that all these people are El Chapo and they're all MS-13 members. Right, and, right. But boy, I mean, we heard testimony from mothers and grandmothers and it was stories like, you know, my kid broke his hip while snowboarding when he was 15 years old and he ended up getting hooked on opioids and, you know, 
became addicted when he couldn't get opioid prescriptions anymore. He turned to heroin. And when he was 18 years old, they caught him with a few grams of heroin. And now he's locked up on a mandatory minimum. <laughs> Uh, I mean, we're locking up teenagers, we're locking up, uh, you know, we heard so many stories and not one came even close to being MS-13, let me tell you. <laughs> these right, were not, exactly. you know, these were, we're not locking up for the most part hardened drug dealers with this. We're locking you know, up. No, you're creating hardened drug dealers. You're creating hardened drug but most of these people are just unfortunate addicts. But getting back to your question of the procedure. So we yeah. got it. So in the committee is where you have all the testimony. And that's usually, you know, where you really get into the meat of the bill and you can be there for hours. I mean, we were there for several hours with people on both sides. Prosecutors came and police came and testified against it. And then families, criminal defense attorneys and retired judges. The retired judges were allowed to speak up because they're not sitting anymore. Um, And everybody had their say. We had a lot of public interest, actually. We overflowed the committee room and it passed very solidly with a majority vote, you know, super strong majority vote through committee. Then it goes up to the floor, in my case, the House floor, since I started it in the House of Representatives, okay. passed with a super majority on the House floor. Then it would go over and you start the process again on the other side where you would start in the Senate committee on the Senate side. And then if it passes there, it would go to the Senate floor and then it would what go to the... What are the names the, of those committees in the House and the Senate? That um, have- here it would be the House Judiciary and Rules Committee and then the Senate Judiciary and Rules Committee. Okay. Well, the problem, and this is, you know, another structural problem that I have with our system here, the way it works in Idaho is um, the chairman is considered the gatekeeper and the chairman has 100% of pow- the power of whether they allow a bill to even get a hearing. Well, if the chairman says, no, I'm not going to let your bill get a hearing, I'm going to stuff it in a drawer, then you're dead in the water because then nobody even gets to vote on it and you have no chance of making it to the next level where they can vote on it on the, on the Senate floor. And that's what happened to me. The Senate chairman, Senator Todd Lakey, said, you know, I'm going to stick with the prosecutors here. I'm not going to let your bill get a hearing or a vote. I'm going to stick it in my drawer. Well, it would never see the light of day. So we rocked it in the House, <laughs> you know, passed it very solidly. Um, but then this one guy, the, the Senate Judiciary Chair, was able to just kind of unilaterally, single-handedly kill it. Right. And, and the reason I think that seems to be really unethical and dishonest on his part to me is that rather than just sit on it and you know refuse to take it further he should openly explain why he thinks it shouldn't pass well i mean he kind of, he, he did i mean in his defense he, he he argued that he thinks that there is deterrence value that you know there will we will deter people from dealing drugs if they see that there are these mandatory minimum sentences on the books now i have a lot of arguments back at that i mean for one thing We don't have mandatory minimum sentences for any other crime, and we have very low incidence of offense in other crimes. So if it were the case that you need mandatory sentences to deter crime, then why the heck don't we have a huge explosion of arson and rape and burglary and, you know, counterfeiting and every other crime on the books? We actually have much lower rates for those crimes than we do for drug offenses. (laughs) So if anything, it's kind of the opposite. We seem to be seeing higher rates of offense in the area where we have mandatories. Um, Other states have gotten rid of their mandatory minimums, and all of them have seen their crime rates go down. So there there is zero evidence to support the idea that, you know, these mandatory minimums help anything. And I put together a really neat little chart that shows from 1992, when they put these mandatory minimums into effect, what our drug offense rate has looked like. It's gone up 710 percent, and that's controlling for population growth. So, you know, the, the, the rate of offense has exploded since they put in the mandatory minimums because of what you said. I think what you said is exactly right. You actually create a criminal when you take a first time nonviolent offender and lock them up for five or 10 years. You take a person that maybe could have been rehabilitated and you convert them into a lifelong criminal. Right, exactly. And they're around people that are going to support that idea, too. They may so, learn the tricks of the trade. They make bad exactly. connections. You don't have to pay tax on it. I mean, it's a great deal. So, <laughs> uh, right. So, what about the other side of it? The money aspect of the profits being generated per capita of the people in yeah. prison. That's a great question. So we had a big problem with that in Idaho. Um, We used to have a privately operated prison here in Idaho um, that uh, was a disaster. I mean, an unbelievable disaster. There was a huge expose. Um, There were incredible abuses going on at the prison. It had been nicknamed Gladiator School uh, Mm -hmm. because there was so much violence in there. I mean, it was incredibly poorly run. Um, 
they were making out like bandits and they were greasing the palms of the legislature. They were making large donations to the governor, to the legislature, to all, you know, um, and uh, ultimately it turns out they were also embezzling from the state. So it turned out that they were falsifying records in terms of how much people were working. Um, and in the end, it went down in a fairly smelly way where, you know, once all of this got exposed, there was a lawsuit and it appeared that they owed the state a large amount of money, like maybe in the tens of millions of dollars. Um, but the governor ended up signing off on a settlement where they, I think, bought out of it for a million dollars or something, which I think was way below what their ultimate liability was. You'd have to double check the exact numbers on that because I um, it's been a while since I've looked at that. But it was the thing did not smell good. Um, it was basically, you know, this org- private organization was making out like a bandit. And they, when they finally got busted, they got off real cheap for what looked like some seriously egregious abuses. Um, so, and at that point, the legislature said, you know, we need to move away from private prisons because this is, you know, this is was such a scandal. Uh-huh. However, um, because our incarceration rates have gone through the roof and we now incarcerate more than any of our neighboring states and it's just been climbing like you wouldn't believe, um, we can't fit people in our state prisons anymore. So, you know, we now, we within Idaho, we don't have private prisons, but because we can't fit prisoners anymore into our Idaho prisons, we are now contracting once again with out-of-state private prisons and paying through the nose to ship them off to for-profit prisons once again, shipping them off to Texas. Um, so, unfortunately, because of our over-incarceration problem, we're basically back in the private prison business. Yeah. Um, and I agree with you 100%. I think it creates a terrifying incentive. I mean, it's just structurally, you're setting yourself up for a world of hurt when you are creating a really powerful, moneyed, private interest out there that is incentivized to get as many people locked up as possible and that has a lot of clout and is playing in our electoral politics. Um, That's just a recipe for huge disaster. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And most of those people filling up the uh, prison population are probably so-called drug offenders, right? Most of them, mm-hmm. so-called drug offenders, and some of most of them probably really are actual drugs, right? I mean, I can't imagine. Well, you, you know, yeah. in, the, in the current case, I'm talking. You know, here it's hemp. Probably most of them are it's actual drugs, but I really don't know how many of them are really hardcore dealers, or you know, I think a lot of them are for possession. Yeah. Um, there's also a bit of a gray area between possession and dealing, where you know you have. You know, a few addicts get together and they prearrange that, you know, hey, you know, Joe's going to pick up the weed for all of us and then we'll all pay him back for our third when we get together. Right. You know, OK, now Joe's a dealer, but it's it's a bit of a gray area. It's not like he's like lurking on the edge of a schoolyard trying to corrupt 10 year olds. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. it's a it's a little bit hard to draw hard and fast lines between who's a user and who's a dealer. Yeah. So the the war on drugs has made illegal drugs into a great business right because you can you can really charge a lot more if it's illegal well that's true exactly it's it's driven the the price up so high where it's you know drawn a lot of interest from criminal organizations right right it's kind of like prohibition right in the 20s yeah yeah, yeah exactly um, yeah. Which, which made a lot of great businesses too but had a, a lot of crime connected to it so yeah. right now um do you know this prosecutor at all that everything depends on? Do you know what she's like? Do you know anything about um, her? I mean, I know her personally. I mean, you know, I don't know her super well, but I've I've spoken to her before. Um, she's yeah. she's come out to testify against my bills. <laughs> and okay. this is, a, I mean, just as a digression, it frustrates me so much because for three years, as I said, I have just poured my heart into trying to get rid of mandatory minimum sentencing for drug yeah. offenses. Yeah, and I've brought every bit of data you could ever find. I've brought, you know, the crime rates from every state that's gotten rid of them. I've brought our incarceration rates. I've brought, you know, just, you know, our crime rates on offenses that have the minimums versus that don't and just every bit of data in the world. And I've been shut down for three years now by the prosecutors every time they have basically managed to block any effort at reforming this um, through their cloud in the legislature. And as I said, through getting the, 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 the Senate chair to block it. But Every time they get up and they say, oh, you don't need to worry. There's no need for judges to have a say on sentencing because you can trust the prosecutors. The prosecutors are the most (laughs) wise and reasonable people you'll ever find. And we don't want to lock people out for silly things. You know, we we will use our discretion and only bring the charges that are perfectly appropriate to the situation. And so 
after having sat through dozens of hours of meetings and testimonies. What a relief that they they have that attitude. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, I mean, but having sat through, as I said, just probably 20 hours of prosecutors going on about how marvelously reasonable and rational and wise they are and how they use their discretion so soundly there's nothing to worry about. Right. And now this hemp truck driver case comes along. I'm kind of like, Really? Okay, well, this would be a wonderful time for you to demonstrate that wise discretion I've been hearing about all these yeah. years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh. So, did you ever get a chance to tell them that, something like that? Um, well, I mean, I kind of put it in an op-ed that I wrote that I published around the state. <laughs> uh -huh. I haven't had a chance to have a face-to-face -face with Ms. Bennett. I reached out, I sent an email and said that um, we would like to. I, I'm, I'm a Democrat, um, but I wrote the article and I'm working on this with a Republican named um, Representative Dorothy Moon, and we uh -huh. both wanted to go in together to meet with her. Um, and uh, she said, you know, well, I don't want to talk about any open criminal pay cases that are pending. But, you know, if after this is all over, you want to talk about the policy issues of legalizing hemp, I'm happy to sit down. Um, but she didn't really want to talk, which, you know, that, that may be that she has a policy against discussing open cases. But time's a wasting here, right? And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to talk about this after the damage is done. Like, I don't want to talk right. to her after the sentencing's happened and these guys' lives are ruined. You know, that policy of not wanting to talk about open cases, maybe with if you don't think about it, it might sound reasonable. But if you think about it at all, that's when you need maximum discussion, when the yeah. case is open, right? Right. I mean, let's try to prevent the injustice before it happens. You know, I'm not really as, you know, it's all well and good if we want to do a post-mortem after the fact and have a nice philosophical discussion about how the system can be improved. And I certainly hope we do that. But, you know, there's three real people's lives on the line here. And I would sure like to get out ahead of this and fix the problem before the damage is done. Yeah. So kind of what the petition is advocating is at least one side of a discussion while the case is still open. Right. I mean, I'm, right. I mean, as I said, the sentencing, I think, is in the third week of June for the first two guys. Um, and once that sentencing happens, there's really not I don't know if there's really anything that can be done to clean up their records. Um, right. And to me, maybe, you know, to me, the record is almost a bigger deal than I mean, five years in prison if they had to do that. I don't think they're going to do five years in prison because the two first guys pled to a lesser offense. Again, I think they were driven to pr to their plea, but the, the what they ultimately pled to does not carry five years, but it still could carry who knows what, whatever, you know, whatever the sentence ends up being. Right. Um, but to me, a, a lifelong criminal record would be much worse than doing a month in prison. You know, there should be some dealing with that in the pardon process, because I'm sure that's often true. If somebody's oh. pardoned because the law should have been nullified and it wasn't, it should come out as not a negative record if that's recognized. Yeah, and I looked into that to see if there was, and actually, you're hitting all my favorite bills. So I had the civil asset forfeiture reform bill, I'm trying to get rid of mandatory minimums, tried to right. legalize hemp. Um, another one that I want to bring next year is a mechanism for expungement, um, yeah. a way of yeah. at least sealing people's records um, so that once they've done their time, they don't have this hanging over their life their, for the rest of their life, making it impossible to get jobs. And, you know, I looked up, I think most states for, these guys are truck drivers, to get a commercial driver's license, most states say that you cannot have a felony conviction that involved the use of a vehicle. So some yeah, felony well, convictions that, you can still get. Which sounds reasonable, yeah. Right, right. And so, you know, these guys may not be able to be truck drivers anymore. There are all kinds of jobs they likely won't be able to get if they have this on the record. So what are you going to do with this expungement thing and when? Because it um, sounds well, urgent, too. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're out of session now, so um, I won't be able to actually bring it as a bill till we get back into session next January, but I'm going to start doing the legwork. I actually already have a draft bill ready, um, but I need to kind of socialize it and have some meetings maybe with the probation and parole people and figure, make sure that my language in it is right. Um, but it would Pennsylvania recently passed something like this, which is where I got the idea. Um, but basically for, you know, relatively minor offenses, you know, I think we certainly don't want, you know, murderers and child rapists and whatnot having their records sealed where nobody knows. But right. for relatively minor, you know, to, to drug, drug possession offenses, you know, maybe breaking and entering, I mean, things that were sort of stupid things people might do in their teens and 20s. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, it would be nice to have a mechanism to at least petition to have it sealed so that, you know, they don't bear the scarlet letter forever. Yeah. Well, especially if laws are changed 
then amen you know that should automatically make the people pre- previously convicted eliminate their record wouldn't that be nice because we have no mechanism for that right now you know I we have that would be a good part of that bill if there's any way to put it in I like that idea. I'll see if I can weave that in. That if you know, if your offense, you know, is subsequently wiped off our criminal code, yes. I, it's that should wipe off everybody that was convicted of that offense before. Right. It was. Yeah. What was the line? You're not gonna like. That's uh, the. How can you ask somebody? I think it was from the Vietnam War. How can you ask somebody to be the last person to die for a mistake? I feel like we're here. We're asking people to be the last piece of people to be incarcerated for a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Exactly. I mean, the, basically, they're admitting by changing the law that that's a law that should have been nullified in the beginning. Right. So nobody should have been convicted for it if it's being eliminated. Uh, absolutely. And and hemp, it's so preposterous. And, you know, to hearkening back to your conversation before of, you know, why was the why was the state police so opposed to legalizing hemp? Yeah. Um, you know, nobody really took the position that hemp is inherently mind altering or that it is inherently a drug. Right. The argument was just that it could be confused with marijuana and it will be difficult to enforce marijuana laws. But, you know, they've got these devices now. Um, that are these small handheld devices. I think they're like those things they used in Men in Black to flash and wipe your memory clean or whatever. They can just yeah. flash it at the plant and yeah. tell whether it has 0.3% or less THC. So it's just not that big a deal. But how far do you take that argument? I mean, okay, sugar looks like cocaine. Are we going to ban exactly. sugar because it might be hard to tell what's sugar and what's cocaine? Or what? I mean, you can't just yeah. ban a perfectly viable, useful substance because it resembles something else. And and, and back to the education thing, it, it, it's kind of part of a bigger picture. You're trying to uplift the condition of society in general. And you can do that with punishment or you can do it with education that gets yeah. you know to the root of problems. And it seems like um, we're a little bit too heavy trying to reform it through total punishment. And it's not working very well. Which should have been obvious from the beginning. It's I, working yeah. terribly. It's it's yeah. the poorest deterrence ever. <laughs> There's also a difference between punishment and stopping something bad from happening. So if you know the punishment yeah. idea comes out of a thousand many thousand year old idea that you've got to make the wrongdoer suffer, and mm-hmm. the same totally justified. And when you when you have wars, both of both sides think they're the justified one, so they want the other side to suffer, and it creates a cycle that never ends. Whereas if you didn't have malice in, involved in it and didn't want anybody to suffer, even bad people, but you wanted to stop the crimes instead, that could change the whole nature of law. Well, one of the things, as I said, I did a ridiculous amount of research, you know, my many years of work on trying to get rid of mandatory sentences. And one of the things I found out, there's been some really interesting work done on the concept of deterrence and how punishment interacts with that. Um, I mean, punishment does have some role in deterrence, but not exactly what they think it does. Um, It's the certainty of punishment that actually holds the deterrent effect, not the severity of it. Um, So if you know you're going to be caught, then, you know, that will have a strong deterrent effect. But, you know, it's it's how likely you think it is that you'll be caught that has the real impact rather than, oh, it's going to be one year or two years or three years or four years. People, there's almost no deterrence effect between locking somebody up for five years. I think I'll do the crime if it's only two years, but I definitely wouldn't do it if it was three years yeah like nobody thinks that way (laughs) unsurprisingly but yeah and they and they found that that basically the length of the sentence has almost no impact on deterrence um which was interesting and actually fit with a lot of the testimony that we that we heard when we had all these hearings where nobody even knew this is what made it so comical the idea that there's some deterrent effect not one of them had even heard of mandatory minimum sentences they had no idea this law was on the books how is it having a deterrent effect if nobody even knows it's there? Now, they're all like, I knew drugs were illegal. I knew I would probably get in some trouble, but I had absolutely no idea what the sentence was. I mean, it's ridiculous to think that these people are out there researching our codes and studying, you know, section 1424A to see like, oh, if I have this many grams of this many years and if, you know, they know it's illegal um, and they know they're going to get in some sort of bad trouble, but they really, they're not being driven by, you know, two years versus five years versus that has no deterrent impact. 
Right. The other aspect of it that's really important, I mean, you you have to stay in the legislature for at least the next 500 years to get all this done. So it's really <laughs> important that you always get reelected. But <laughs> oh, thank uh, you. Yeah, I, that's what I think anyway. But, I hope it uh, won't be 500 years. I'm getting a well, little depressed at how years, long it's no, taking that, on some of this you stuff. You get but. really <laughs> tired by that time. But what I wanted to bring up is the aspect of so-called rehabilitation. That if that was actually done in prison, prison would become a positive place that would turn out people who didn't have an interest in doing any harm to anybody anymore. And I don't know how much uh, real attention is being put into how to do that, but I think there are incredible possibilities. Yeah, and there, you know, we. I think we have some good folks running our corrections here. You know, I think, I think some of the problems that we have aren't necessarily. It's not their fault they have to lock these people up, right? It's not their right. choice. It's, right. Right. <laughs> it's a combination of bad laws and prosecutors who want to just, you know, push everything to the wall. Um, but they have tried. You know, they've introduced some training programs. They've introduced, um, you know, welding programs and carpentry programs and some skills enhancement programs. Um, I think it would be great if we had more in there that was, you know, focused on counseling and drug treatment. Yeah. Uh, there's a little bit, but not nearly enough on that front. Um, and, uh, you know, you're right, because that, that, that should really be our goal is to get people that can come out and just have a very low recidivism rate. Funnily enough, though, one of the things, as I mentioned before, because we are, our prisons are bursting at the seams and we're having to ship people away, um, right, right. the private prison that many of these people are getting sent to it's a disaster. I mean, the prison has a contract where they say they only want to take the primo prisoners. So they've said, you know, they don't want the hard guys. They don't want the guys who are going to riot. They only they prefer the first time nonviolent offenders. So we're taking these people that are, you know, locked up on first time drug possession offenses, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. The people that would be most rehabilitatable. And right. instead, we're shipping them off to Texas, where the conditions are horrible, much worse than in our prisons here, where they don't have these nice programs on training them and welding and carpentry. Uh-huh. But one of the pieces of data I found is that you actually have a much higher recidivism rate when prisoners are shipped far from home. That when they are far away and they can no longer get those family visits, um, that um, they really lose their sense of connection to the community um, and actually have a much, you know, that's when they really fall in with the bad crowd. They kind of lose hope. They lose their ambition to, you know, turn their life around and, you know, turn over a new leaf. um, And they really go down a bad path. So we're doing the worst thing we could possibly be doing by taking the people that could be have the most promise of being fixed and putting them in the worst possible situation where they are most likely to be driven to recidivism. And how much Uh, is that costing the state to do that? At the highest possible cost, because the cost of sending them to these private prisons is higher than keeping them in state. Okay, so what about, as an alternative to that, putting out a request for proposals for private companies within Idaho that would be, could prove that they were true rehabilitation centers? Well, I think that would be great if we had any service providers like that. Um, you know, I would hope that they would look very hard and put a preferential, well, you know, look on those folks. But I don't think we have any services if you made, like that. If you made the offer attractive enough, you might get some to move in. Well, that would be terrific. I, mean, I, I like that know. idea. Yeah, I think that's just, a great idea. I love that. And, and let them be evaluated in their performance by by how they drop the recidivism rate. Well, I, I mean, I think even I, I would like to see institutions that are more oriented toward rehabilitation, but even just having them in state would be a huge improvement right. as one of the most. I mean, I was driven to tears repeatedly during all these um, these hearings. But one of the most heartbreaking ones was a teenager um, who was locked up and again, shipped off to Texas because he was you know, a good kid who is, you know, doing well and well behaved. So they picked him to ship to Texas. um, And the mom was in there telling the whole story. And it it was horrible. I mean, he was he was an addict. And during the time between when he was arrested and when he was sentenced, while he was out on bail awaiting sentencing and trial, he completely turned his life around. He went to rehab. He got a job. He was basically already rehabilitated. But because of the mandatory minimum sentences, they couldn't do anything about it. They were like, oh, sorry, you were found with this much drugs on you. You have to go to prison now. doesn't matter that you basically turned your life around and are fixed. Then they compound the problem and send them to Texas. 
Well, he was super, super close to his grandparents, um, who were almost like second parents to him, because I think he had a single mom very, very close to his grandparents. Um, and once he was shipped away to Texas, they weren't able to travel down there, and they were, you know, unwell, and, you know, and they're, and they're nearing the end. And she was like, he's probably never going to see his grandparents alive again. They were so heartbroken. They would visit him, you know, multiple times a week. And now, you know, the closest people in his life to him, he's never going to be able to see again because they shipped him off to Texas. So this was presented in the legislature to let everybody know what happened? Yep, yep. The mom got up and told the story and there was not a dry eye in the house. And I think we passed the we passed the bill like 15 to 2 or something out of committee that year. And what, <laughs> I mean, what did the uh, bill do? What did the hmm? bill do? What did the bill do? Well, this was my bill to get rid of mandatory minimum sentences. Okay, okay. So yeah. in the house it worked. Yeah, this is the bill that I keep passing through the house but that they keep refusing to vote on in the Senate. Wow. One of but the I, things- I tell you, anybody that could hear that mom, um, is, it was very hard to uh, argue that the system is working the way it should when you heard that story. Did she tell the story in the Senate, too? She never got to. They didn't hold a hearing. Okay. And there's no way that you could get them to do that, huh? Well, I begged. Believe me, I begged. I got. I, I. I. convinced every. I was handing out the chairman's email address on little slips of paper at my town halls and asking everybody to email him and ask him to hold okay, a hearing. Good, good. I. I. You know. I wrote articles in the paper. I tried everything to try to get him to hold a hearing, and he wouldn't. Um, but she, the, the woman in question, at least, you know, she did go on the news and she got her story out there a little bit through traditional media. Um, right. But the Senate committee never got to hear from her. Isn't it interesting that like pretty much every other real issue I can even think of, this has no partisan aspect at all. Right? I love unless, that about it. I love unless that about I'm it. missing I, something yeah. about it. I mean, no, it's been wonderful that way. I mean, as I said, you know, I'm I'm a Democrat. Every year I've brought it, I've had very strong Republican support. Um, yeah. It's been completely bipartisan. Um, you know, every single Democrat voted for it, and a, I think a solid majority of the Republicans voted for it, too. Um, so it's, uh, no, it's, this is something that absolutely crosses party lines. And at the federal level, it did, too. You know, that's one of the few right. successes we've seen on a bipartisan basis in recent years was that First Step Act. That um, and that actually reformed mandatory minimums and a lot of other things at the federal level, and it passed like ninety-two to eight or something crazy, which in this day and age you never see. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, exactly. You know, like, I mean, I, it makes me wonder how much of the rest of it, all the other kinds of issues, are actually nonpartisan too. Yeah. And with the with the parties telling their members, well, this is what you should think and believe on, on both sides. But really, if they could drop that nonsense and say, what's true? Yeah. What, what's really happening in this issue? And I think if they ever would get a hold of that, almost nothing would be partisan anymore. I hope I see that day sometime, someday. Yeah. I mean, what, I've really enjoyed these issues because I really, you know, it's a lot more fun working together with people in kind of a productive way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, and I, I hope that this, you know, that these criminal justice reform issues can be a bridge to more areas where we can break down those partisan barriers. Me too. Me too. So um, we're going to quit in a minute here. So anything that sure. you want people to remember from this discussion as kind of a bottom line to hold with them? Well, I'm just thrilled that people are paying attention to this. I think um, we're we're right on this issue, but until the public really gets engaged in it, I think historically it's been kind of a wonky thing that not a lot of people follow. Um, but people really, I think when the public really steps up and starts making their voice heard, we can really get somewhere on it. And it, it's an issue with spillover effect because even if you don't have a family or loved one in prison and you never know when you might, right? Yeah. I mean, you never know when your kid might do something right. stupid or your friend. I mean, we are all on the other side of this issue, whether we know it or not. Any, yeah. like, you know, tomorrow people's world could turn upside down and something may happen that you never anticipated and exactly. someone you know and love about is on the receiving end of this. But beyond that, I mean, the money that's paying for all this is coming out of schools, it's coming out of roads, it's coming out of healthcare. I mean, this is an issue that has huge impact really on every facet of life just because it's the giant sucking sound eating up our treasury. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. um, everybody needs to care and everybody needs to pipe up. And I feel like if I could get the, you know, the right level of public engagement, I could blast through the things that are holding us back on fixing the problem. Yeah, yeah. Everybody should be the government, huh? Yeah, big time. Okay, well, 
I hope we'll get to do some follow-ups on this and other important things that come up. Great. Um, because it's just exciting to me that anybody with a great motivation to, to actually help everybody instead of fight over all this stuff, is, is there. I mean, that deserves everybody's support. Oh, so, well, I really appreciate you helping to shine a light on this. Yeah, thanks for the time, and uh, hold on, we'll say goodbye in the break here. Thanks. Okay, so there goes Ilana Rubel. She is, uh, her technical position is the House Representative for District 18 in Idaho. Very fortunate district to have somebody who actually cares about the people of the district representing them are like a a real representative. It's an amazing concept. I'd like to see it become popular. And the reason that this kind of a a discussion, getting to meet someone like this is really um, super exciting event for me is that I just have this picture of what the country would be like, and it could be replicated in other countries everywhere, of course, of an actual representative government, I think that would be incredible. You know, not representing the uh, necessarily the the interests of corporations that may or may not care anything about the people who live there, but the real interests of the people. You know, like not having them thrown in jail for really stupid laws. Um, the whole idea of nullification is to protect against laws that are completely ridiculous, like the one of getting arrested for driving a truckload of hemp across the state. Um, I don't even think it should be illegal to, you know, move marijuana around, or at least to use it, but although I would never recommend using it, I think that's not intelligent at all. But the idea of filling up prisons with people so they get worse and then go out and do more crimes is not working very well. But certainly for industrial hemp, which is a crop that's so valuable and important that early in the country's history, it was actually required in some cases that the farmers grow it. There's so many good things that can be made out of it. Um, And for prosecutors and judges and everybody else that's involved in the criminal, so-called criminal justice system, which has a long way to go before it really is that, they need to recognize, I mean, if the jury and other people are not in a position to... um, nullify a law that is really counterproductive. Prosecutors should never prosecute anybody for some kind of a law like that. I mean, that's the power's in their hands. And I agree with, uh, I guess it was the uncle of Spider-Man, right, who said, with great power comes great responsibility. Well, prosecutors, that means you. And it means anybody else that happens to be watching this broadcast that in the positions of power and and. The secret to that is everybody's in positions of power. So they have great responsibility. That means me and you and everybody. And to have a representative that's actually taking that seriously and trying to do a good job with it, that's great. I would like to see that spread everywhere. And her petition to drop the chart to the the prosecutor, who is Jan Bennett's, B-E-N-N-E-T-T-S in Idaho. And her email, as we mentioned in the discussion, is Bennett's at, what is it, A-D-A, A-D-A county dot I-D dot gov. Phone number 208-287-7700. That's a public phone number. Anybody could look it up. But um, I, I'm not advocating... Uh, getting into a contentious argument with this lady at all. That's not the way to do it. Because you're not trying to prove that you're right. You're trying to get a change in her attitude. And the way to do that is be somebody she would respect and not somebody who's just there to fight with her. That's totally not a good idea. So let her know how she could become a great example to all the prosecutors of the world and the U.S. and anywhere else by, by using wisdom and saying, you don't ruin people's lives in a victimless crime for a crime that should never have been a crime to begin with. And if you have wisdom as prosecutor, Jan, you don't do that. And so we need millions of people to remind her of that. And I think it would be worth a couple of minutes of your time. So anyway, I'm, I'm hoping that our, our project to find great people in 
government at any position or in um, positions of power within corporations other than government, too, because governments are corporations, but private corporations, too, people within the higher positions of those need to wake up and, you know, what I mean by waking up is develop self-awareness that you're not just to be, supposed to be a robot enforcing destructive policies for your own uh, position, okay? That's that's not conscious. It's not a good way to use your your uh, your authority. So we want a, uh, people within positions of power, wherever you are, to um, start realizing that's their opportunity to really do some good for for humanity. And anybody like that? If you guys hear of anybody who might be receptive to that, who could uh, start becoming an ally within the system. Let us know, Richard at LostArtsRadio.com, and we'll help give them a platform on the air as long as we're allowed to do that. Uh, if we disappear from major platforms, which is probably going to happen because the censorship issue is really important, um, find us at LostArtsRadio.com or Brighteon.com, B-R-I-G-H-T-E-O-N.com, which is a new rising alternative where they don't censor people doing videos, and they need more exposure and need you to post your videos there and watch your videos there. It's a great new site. Deserves to be supported. Um, I think that's most of what I wanted to let you know about. Um, this is all something that depends on uh, awakening of individuals in society and one person becoming conscious, dropping all the partisan nonsense and realizing that they just want to know whatever's true, whether it agrees with or contradicts what they thought before is irrelevant. They want to learn. And that's the point. And as you develop real aware self-awareness within yourself, um, everything you do, everything you say, all your work on the outside, interactions with your family and friends, um, everything takes on a whole new dimension. And there's a certain amount I can say about that on the public forums like this um, they are subject to disappearance even with me trying to watch my language and keep it uh, acceptable to the censors but if you want to go further with it and, and really develop yourself as, as a center broadcasting on a subtle level in all that you do that's going to bring people together and, and encourage others to wake up check out planetaryhealingclub.com we're there live every week, interactive, and we can go much deeper into all of these things in that private uh, forum, and you're in personally invited. We're looking for people anywhere in the world that want to be part of that project, and I'll tell you more about it when I meet you there, planetaryhealingclub.com. Otherwise, watch for our free videos on all the major platforms as long as we're there, and uh, for our next guest show on Sunday night. I hope you have a great week, and thanks for being with us. I'll talk to you then. Introducing Lost Arts Radio Live, our new Saturday late afternoon, early evening, one-hour live stream show. This new show precedes our Planetary Healing Club, which starts at 9 p.m. Eastern and 6 p.m. Pacific. The Planetary Healing Club, which is not free and open to the public, but you can join for a minimum donation of just $10 a month. Our new live stream show, which is free starts Saturdays at 7.30 p.m. Eastern and 4.30 Pacific. It can be accessed by going to lostartsradio.com slash live. You can tune into our live stream from our Facebook page at facebook.com slash lostartsradio, from our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash lostartsradio, as well as both Periscope and Twitter at lostartsradio. You can ask questions during the show by using the chat function on YouTube or make a comment on Facebook during the live stream. Once again, that's Lost Arts Radio Live, Saturdays at 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific. As of January 2018, the Saturday Live Call-In Show is now an interactive video platform called the Planetary Healing Club. The cost is just a $10 minimum monthly donation automatically billed through your PayPal account. Sign up at lostartsradio.com slash club. The Planetary Healing Club is every Saturday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. You get your link to participate in the show upon signing up as a member. 
Those shows are also archived as well for club members. Listen to our new shows with guests every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. All Sunday shows with guests have archives freely available on our website at lostartsradio.com. You can also find them at blogtalkradio.com forward slash lostartsradio, as well as our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash the letter C forward slash lostartsradio. Mixcloud at mixcloud.com forward slash lostartsradio. And finally, look us up under the podcast directory on iTunes. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash lostartsradio or on Twitter at Lost Arts Radio. Be sure to join the free Lost Arts Radio Facebook group as well. Just search for Lost Arts Radio group within Facebook. You can also join our forum on our website if you want to interact with other listeners. We also have links to all of the great independent musicians whose music we feature each week on Lost Arts Radio. When you do your Amazon shopping, please use Amazon Smile Program at smile.amazon.com. And when you choose Lost Arts Research Institute in Sedona, Arizona as your charity, Amazon will donate half a percent of whatever your order total is to Lost Arts Research Institute to help fund the building of the school and keep our radio show on the air. Please visit lostartsresearchinstitute.org for more information on the school we want to build. Be sure to sign up for our free weekly newsletter on our site under the Radio Show tab or right from the button on our Facebook page. Contact Richard at richard at lostartsradio.com or myself, Doug Diamond, at doug at lostartsradio.com. Thanks again for listening to Lost Arts Radio and we'll see you again next week. Oh, you want me to be Perfect one It's so easy to see Why I push you away Heaven inside my heart Holding out for change Yeah, our world is a mess Planets in distress Oh, and everyone's so afraid Of making mistakes Heaven above our heads And hell below our feet Oh, I walk for countless miles To a tune that pushes me And it calls out my name Oh, it's time for a change Yeah, it's time for a change You say I've done you wrong Still you wrote me this song Now still you stay away You haven't called me for days With heaven inside my heart and hell in front of me Oh, I walk the endless miles To where I need to be And we're all the same Oh, now we're holding out for change And now we're holding out for change
Yeah, it's time for a change